Welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy or PIPE workshop at the Bedrosian Center here at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the PIPE Collaborative. And our workshop speaker today is Miguel Pereira. Miguel is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Southern California. He holds a PhD in political science from Washington University in St. Louis, 2020. Miguel's presentation today is The Expertise Curse, How Policy Expertise Can Hinder Responsiveness. Following Miguel's presentation, we'll have a formal discussant, Alexander Cerrone from the Government Department at Cornell University. During Miguel's talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or use the hand raise feature. I'll be monitoring questions and I'll determine if they need to be asked immediately or if they can wait until the end. And without further ado, I give you Miguel Pereira. Thank you so much for the invitation, Jeff. It's really a pleasure to be sharing my work here with you. And thank you also, uh, um, Ali, for uh, the comments that I look forward to. So uh, what I'm presenting today was actually the last chapter of my dissertation. Um, at the beginning, it was this half big thing, but I think I'm growing fond of this over time. Um, uh, it's joint work with Patrick Oberg from the University of Gothenburg. And <clears throat> it's part of this bigger project where I try to understand how politicians build their image of the electorate and how this image can shape the process of representation. There's, uh, I think it's worth emphasizing this right from the beginning. There's a kind of fairly rare feature of this study in my experience at least. Um, which is the fact that uh, we are able to return to the group of politicians that we uh, that were part of the study that I'll show you. And so uh, I'm mentioning this because if you have ideas or suggestions <clears throat> for ways to improve the study, you can keep that in mind. So it, it's possible to return to these fellows and uh, and ask them some more questions. So uh, let's let's move on. Okay, so the broad motivation that uh, uh, started the project um, is uh, a goal to understand variation in policy responsiveness. We know that uh, on aggregate, uh, in cross-national studies, within country studies, we show that um, we know that government policies tend to roughly follow citizens' preferences. However, there's a great deal of variation. Uh, the degree to which this happens. So just some example from Lex and Phillips in the US, uh, where they showed that only roughly half the policies implemented in US states uh, are aligned with majority preferences at the state level. There's also growing evidence, both in the US and in Europe, uh, of evidence for subconstituency responsiveness. So basically some segments of the electorate seem to have an easier time converting their preferences into policy. <clears throat> More affluent, resourceful segments of the electorate, um, for instance. There are a number of explanations for uh, this, these patterns of variation in the degree to which public preferences are translated into policy. Some, some research uh, points to institutional incentives, different electoral uh, systems, for instance. Um, also, contextual dynamics play a role, for instance, in contexts of economic crisis, it appears that governments have a harder time uh, responding to public preferences for kind of obvious reasons. Uh, obviously, proximity to elections can also constrain or influence uh, responsiveness. There's also some work uh, suggesting that representational roles that politicians may adopt can influence uh, this process. However, um, existing evidence suggests that responsiveness also varies by policy issue. So most of uh, the arguments uh, in the literature suggest that provide explanations that either apply to every politician in, in similar ways or apply differently to different politicians, but they should be constant across issues. And uh, just to give some example from the seminal work by Miller and Stokes back in the 50s, um, they showed that U.S. Uh, public opinion played a key role in uh, 
predicting uh, civil rights policies, but it had almost no role in explaining foreign policy, for instance. So there's some variation across issues that these theories, uh, I believe, don't, don't properly explain. So, so this leads us to the main question, other the broad question of the study, why do politicians respond to public preferences on some issues, but uh, not on other issues, okay? So the argument that we propose in a nutshell, and this obviously is not meant to be an argument to explain everything, it's probably part of a very larger, much larger explanation, uh, is that the policy expertise, although key for policy making, can constrain the ability of politicians to voice public preferences. And the idea is relatively simple. So policy expertise, there's a, a vast literature in cognitive psychology showing that expertise is often associated with overconfidence and close-minded cognition, uh, which is basically a fancy term for uh, dogmatism, so being less open to different ideas. And this in turn may lead politicians to discount opinions they disagree with, what I call here disagreement discounting. This term is not mine, it comes from uh, research by uh, Butler and Dines that showed that uh, US state and local officials systematically discount opinions from voters they disagree with. Okay. What we argue here basically is that uh, this tendency to discount opinions we disagree can uh, be more prominent, more prevalent, in uh, areas where politicians have uh, more expertise, more specialized knowledge and experience. Uh, how does this relate to responsiveness? I'll, I'll, I'll say more about this in a second, but basically, uh, if you systematically discount opinions you disagree, you may have a distorted image of what the public uh, wants on a given issue, and, and that can basically constrain your ability to voice public preferences. Just to preview the rest of the talk, uh, the first study uh, looks directly at this relationship between policy expertise and uh, disagreement discounting, the tendency of politicians to discount opinions they disagree with. And the second study uh, looks at the mechanism that we propose, the effects of expertise on overconfidence and closed-minded cognition. Okay, so uh, going into more detail into the, the, the theory here, <clears throat> we know that efficient policy making requires expertise. And, and this is uh, clear um, for anyone who studies uh, legislatures, the, the parliaments across the world, the US Congress are designed to uh, promote expertise among legislators. They encourage a division of labor among <clears throat> members of each party. And that, and, and that is the source, the goal of that is to promote expertise on different policy areas. Committee systems are designed exactly with this goal in mind. Uh, some research by Alice Iran shows that uh, very effectively. Um, at the same time, we know that expertise also uh, can influence behavior in different ways. Specifically, it can influence how we process information and make decisions, okay? Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, uh, there's research showing that expertise is associated with or causes, to be more specific, causes self-assurance. So uh, policy experts tend to be, sorry, I see something in the chat going on here. Okay. Uh, expertise uh, tends to be associated with self-assurance, individuals being more confident about their beliefs and uh, more likely to hold stable uh, attitudes. However, this uh, confidence is often unwarranted. Experts often overestimate the accuracy of their beliefs. There are a number of reasons why this may happen, uh, but uh, researchers often describe this as an issue of illusions of understanding. Um, one of the issues is, is that experts are averse to recognizing that they don't know of, about the certain a specific issue, and this kind of generates this illusion that you know more than, you, than what you actually know. <clears throat> One possible explanation for this um, has to do with the fact that most of this specialized knowledge that we acquire in our life uh, happens at the short period of, in a short period of time, concentrated around a college degree or some 
um, very specific period of your time. And then over the rest of your life, you fail to update the fact that you are forgetting this information. You still identify it as an expert, but um, you, uh, you, yes, the, the actual knowledge in which this expertise relies uh, is, is, is less clear. Um, expertise is also has been shown to be associated with close-minded cognition. So politicians basically being less open to different ideas. Um, <clears throat> what this research suggests is that people with uh, low levels of expertise tend to be more open-minded and accepting of criticism. Okay, uh, so these two um, uh, externalities of expertise are relevant to understand, in our view, uh, the responsiveness because they can lead politicians to discount opinions they disagree with. Okay. This is important because to be responsive, politicians have to account for the preferences of those they agree with, but also those they disagree with. Okay? Just to finish the, the, the line of thought, so if politicians systematically discount the signals of voters with different opinions in their areas of expertise, this can um, first generate a distorted image of the electorate, of public preferences on those issues, and, and kind of create obstacles for responsive. <clears throat> okay, so we coined this, this idea, uh, the expertise curse. We are actually not the first ones to use this, uh, this term, but I only figured that, noticed that um, uh, after, after we, we started thinking about it this way. The idea basically is that specialized knowledge can constrain the ability of legislators to incorporate uh, different views, okay? Very importantly, we, are, we, we use the term curse here, not in a derogatory way, <clears throat> not saying that yeah, this is a problem you have. We use the term curse simply to capture the idea that this is an implicit bias, at least according to our argument. It's an implicit bias, something that is activated without the awareness or an intentional control of the legislator. To put this differently, uh, basically what we mean here is that politicians are not um, discounting opinions strategically, at least that's our argument, they're not doing this with their uh, active awareness. And so this may actually lead them to adopt policies that they would probably otherwise not uh, pursue if they were aware of this issue. Okay. <clears throat> so there are two main predictions that come from this argument. First, we expect legislators to be more likely to dismiss opposing views from voters in their areas of expertise. And second, uh, in line with the mechanism we propose, we expect expertise to produce self-confidence and close-minded cognition, okay? I'll just have a glass of water here. So we test these two um, predictions. Uh, in two experiments with Swedish politicians. They were both fielded as part of this panel of politicians. This is a biannual panel of uh, Swedish politicians. It's now in its uh, 15th wave, I believe. Uh, so every six months, uh, a group of scholars at uh, the University of Gothenburg reach out to this, to this, uh, this pool of uh, politicians. There's a long run, long-term relationship in Sweden between politicians and researchers that is fairly unique and that allows researchers to uh, have this type of continuing relationship with politicians. Uh, <clears throat> so roughly 70, 73% of the sample is composed by local elected officials, but there are some representatives from regional governments and national and the European parliament too. Uh, the distribution uh, across parties is actually fairly close to the distribution in Parliament, except for the Sweden Democrats, the far-right party that uh, uh, gained a lot of momentum and uh, attention in the last decade. Okay. <clears throat> so the first study was uh, conducted as part of this uh, wave and the second study as part of this second wave. <clears throat> so the first study, the goal is to 
uh, answer this question. Are legislators more likely to dismiss constituency appeals in their areas of expertise? How do we do this? The main goal here is to uh, isolate the effect of expertise on how politicians engage with voters, respond to uh, uh, voter, voter signals, voter information from voters. Um, we thought about different ways of doing this. We, for instance, one way of doing it would be to uh, provide some information, some specific information to some, not provide some information to others, and treat this as some additional expertise that was given to uh, the treatment group. We thought this could not capture what expertise is. Um, it, it would be just a, a, something that is different from uh, specialized knowledge acquired over time and everything that comes with that. So instead, we leverage natural variation in policy expertise across a series of policy issues. They are basically randomly assigned to an area where they have high expertise or low expertise. Then after some steps, they are presented with a, a policy appeal from a group of voters. This policy appeal is always asking them to pursue a policy they disagree with. And then they are asked to evaluate this policy appeal. I, <coughs> I presented this just last, last Friday and I, I had the same idea. Well, we can't, we can't manipulate expertise. But um, actually the paper that was presented right before mine was this really ambitious uh, experiment where they randomly assigned women in Ethiopia to either have jobs or be unemployed. So probably there are some ways of doing this and I'm happy to hear your thoughts. But I, I think for now, I'm happy with the solution. That's what I would say. Uh, okay, so first step, we elicit policy expertise uh, through this question. We ask them, public officials have to deal with several different issues as part of their job. It's important to be, it's impossible to be an expert in all of them. So below there's a list of common issues governments have to deal with identify the areas in which you have more and less expertise. So just one and the other. So what we're doing here is basically measuring relative expertise on different issues, okay? From here, we randomly assign these legislators to either a high expertise issue area or a low expertise issue area. Okay, uh, a little later in the survey, uh, we well, first, that's, this is what I would say. For each of those five issue areas, we identified one specific policy initiative. So for instance, for healthcare, the policy was preventing private companies from operating hospitals, okay? Uh, there's one for each of these. Uh, we asked the politicians' opinions on these issues. There were a bunch of other policy questions in this battery uh, to avoid, um, uh, well, to making it less clear that there was a relationship between this part of the study and this part. Um, we, in picking these questions, we, we ensured that the policies were salient based on a series of pretests, and also that public opinion on these issues was sufficiently divided. So the goal here was to make it equally plausible that someone may be either opposed or in favor of each of these policies. <clears throat> So we ask them these questions because the policy appeal that they receive later in the survey uh, was always asking them to pursue a policy they disagree with. Okay, so if they are in favor of preventing private hospitals from operating, uh, sorry, private companies from operating hospitals, if they are against it, the group of voters ask them to support this policy. Okay. We do this because of this prior research that I already mentioned by Butler and Dines, showing that politicians systematically discount opinions they disagree with. Okay, so by keeping disagreement constant, we are able to isolate the effect of expertise. Okay, so after this, and actually after the rest of the survey where we talked about all, um, well, there were a bunch of other things going on. They were presented with this hypothetical, uh, policy appeal. This one is on healthcare, but there's one for each of those um, policy issues. So I'll just briefly mention here, different groups of voters contact politicians with uh, political propositions. 
Uh, imagine a group of voters is approaching you and wants you to support or oppose a proposal to ban companies from running hospitals. And the arguments uh, to do this are basically symmetrical in their against or uh, in favor. Um, the exact position, just to repeat this, the exact position of voters on the issue is such that it's always opposed to the preferences of the legislators as uh, elicited in, the, in those questions before. Yeah, I should be fine. Okay, finally, they were presented with these four questions that basically ask them to evaluate this policy appeal. First, whether they agree that the group understands the complexities of the issue, that their opinion is based on facts, that they hold this opinion strongly, and that this opinion represents the majority uh, opinion. Okay, so the first three items, the question wording also comes from Butler and Dines. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the way I interpret this, the first three issues um, basically provide rationales for politicians to discount and to, to dismiss a certain opinion. Okay, instead of asking them directly, this, this, this idea doesn't make any sense, uh, <clears throat> we can ask them agreement, levels of agreement to, to these statements, which basically minimizes uh, social desirability bias. The last item captures more directly this ability of recognizing that an opinion that is uh, different from their own can be the, the opinion of the majority. Okay. So just to rephrase what I just told you, the steps of this study, we first elicit relative expertise in five policy areas. We measure policy preferences on specific issues, including issues in those five policy areas. We are randomly assigned them to receive policy appeal either in the high expertise, higher expertise uh, domain or the lower expertise uh, domain. Okay, so here we have the main results of the first study. <laughs> On the y-axis, there are uh, the four um, statements that I just described to you. And on the x-axis, we have um, the differences between uh, in levels of agreement between those in the high expertise condition versus the low expertise condition. Okay, so we find uh, basically for three of the four outcomes, we find results consistent with this expertise curse hypothesis. So politicians are systematically less likely to agree with the statement that voters understand the complexity of the issue when presented with. Um, uh, 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 an appeal in their areas of expertise. Importantly, since the position of voters on the issue is basically a function of uh, the individual preferences of politicians, this, um, <clears throat> so th these results are not explained by the exact position of uh, voters on those issues. I'll talk more about that. Um, in terms of effect sizes, uh, this estimate here, basically corresponds to a 12% change in standard deviation. So these are not large effects. They're not small effects either. Um, finally, they are also in the high expert, expertise condition. Politicians are also uh, systematically less likely to agree with the statement that the opinion is aligned with the majority of voters. Okay. <clears throat> Across uh, treatments, only 20% of uh, respondents concede or recognize that this policy appeal is aligned with the majority. And this independently of whether politicians are in favor or against a given issue. Um, this is consistent with prior research showing that politicians systematically discount opinions they disagree with. However, as you see here, this is more likely in areas where they have high levels of expertise. Uh, question, question. Sorry, I can't get my video to work for some reason. So uh, the host has turned it off. But um, question on the first, I, I'm just trying to think through a little bit the first two questions that you're asking here. Um, I guess it, it seems reasonable to me that experts, in fact, I would be very surprised if experts uh, didn't I think that voters uh, were more likely to think voters didn't understand the complexity of, of the issue. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I, I mean, I, both those first two, I'm, I'm like, well, of course, that's what experts 
uh, experts know more. So, so they're going to see much more complexity than voters do. I don't know what this tells us about experts uh, that we don't already know at, at some level. So maybe I'm missing something. No, no it's, it's a fair point. Uh, the, the idea here is that the design of the study prov it provides uh, the results in situations where, like for the same issue, voters are either in favor or against an issue. And regardless of their actual position on the issue, on average, uh, um, experts are more likely to just say that the position uh, is, is, the voters don't understand the complexity of the issue and also they don't base their opinion on facts, regardless of the actual opinion, right? Being in favor or against, that's, that's my point here. I, I understand that point. Uh, I think uh, wait, wait, I think I might, I might misunderstood you. It's not it's not random. We're, we're not asking the voters to react to a random uh, opinion. We're asking them to react to one that disagrees with their expertise. Yes, exactly. And it's not random, right? It, it, right? No, 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 no. It's true. They uh, the result with fixed effects by issue. They kind of account for. It's still not for. It's still it's not exactly perfect. What I mean, but. Um, it's not purely independent of the exact position of voters. It holds, that's what I want to say, it holds when politicians are either in favor or against the issue. That's what I want to say. Right, but I, I'm just thinking, let's suppose we had a different model, which was just a one of rational legislators and they have some expertise. Well, let's say expertise means you get a signal and you're more informed than everybody else. So your signal makes you more informed. It might be, you might've got a, the wrong signal, but at least you got, you got a signal. So you're more informed on average you're gonna disagree with other people more than, than the people that don't have a signal. That's perfectly rational. There's nothing behavioral there. That's just the way an expert should behave, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. I, I see this as a combination. The, the results, I believe they're relevant. Uh, look when, when we consider all the outcomes together. Uh, okay, so. and, and, just, and just so I understand the last part when, with the majority opinion. So, so yeah. this is the so, so you're it, it, there's an objective sense that a majority of this particular official's constituents disagree with 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 uh with with this position. So I'm a mayor. You actually have opinion data from from that person's city. Let's let's suppose, uh, or I'm a legislator from my district. You're, you're looking at opinion data from that person's constituents. Is that yeah right? yeah yeah? So that's what I mean here in the second point. I compare how likely experts and non-experts are to side with the majority opinion on, on, uh, on each of these issues, uh, and they are not more likely to, to side with the majority opinion. No, but I don't mean majority like over the whole country or some general peer, opinion oh, poll. Specifically, the majority of their constituents, because they have, they have no, we have no reason to believe they know anything about their own, their, nor should they pay any attention perhaps to, their, to people who aren't their constituents. So it, it wouldn't surprise me that people got elected. I'm a group, I'm a person that cares about an issue very strongly, so do my constituents. I might think that they're, they're, they're representative of the general population. I don't know, actually. I don't know anything about those other guys. But it seems to me it's not, it, again, what, what, what we'd want to know is, that are they missing their own constituents? Are, yeah. are, do, are they misunderstanding their own constituents? Yeah, that's a good, that's a fair but, point. But, 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 but I'm, not, I'm not trying to, I mean, I think what you're doing is very, very interesting here. I just, it was more just why I understand, but I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, you're not looking at the opinion of their own constituents. You're Absolutely. looking at opinion of some sort of general poll. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay, that, that, that's good. I mean, you have, you have to do something. I just want to fix in my head exactly no. what it is, what the, what the strengths and what the limitations are. So Thank in you. this particular sample, there's not enough national level politicians. So that's not an issue in, well, it can still be an issue depending on how we define constituencies. If they are just the party constituency or the district constituency, we still don't have that data. If we describe this as the national uh, constituency, it's a different story. So I would have to think about a slightly different design to address that issue. Uh, uh, it's still, yeah, yeah. I, uh, how much this is a problem, this measurement issue of not measuring constituency opinion, but national uh, electorate opinion. Uh, and yeah, I would have to think more about how this may affect uh, the results, but um, very good point, John, thank you. Uh, let me move forward here. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> we conduct uh, still on this first study a fairly exploratory analysis here, trying to understand whether certain types of knowledge may be more conducive to what we call expertise curves. And we distinguish based on the literature between two types of expertise formal expertise that uh, comes usually 
uh, is described as something that comes from extended study of a particular topic. Uh, we, we, we measure it uh, by whether politicians have a college degree or not on a specific issue. And passive expertise, which is something that comes from exposure through life or professional experiences. Um, <clears throat> this basically uh, is something that comes from, from your experience in office, for instance, from your experience in a specific committee. Um, so we basically uh, replicate the main uh, results interacting uh, uh, these different measures of expertise with uh, types of expertise with uh, our treatment. Um, and so here on the left panel, we have the effects by uh, distinguish between politicians with a college degree, so a measure of formal uh, expertise, and, and without a college degree. And here it's uh, politicians with above average or below average uh, experience in office. Okay, so what I think is interesting here, this was not uh, pre-registered, uh, uh, pre and obviously these measures of uh, for actual expertise are not causally identified but we find uh, effects that suggest that um, politicians with formal expertise are more likely to engage in this uh, type of, um, yeah, of uh, disagreement discounting, okay? That's, that's the, the message from this, this part of the study. Okay, jumping to the second study real quick, let me just check, yeah. Uh, so the second study, basically we, we tried to test whether in line with our mechanism, uh, whether expertise can induce self-confidence and close-minded college. Again, we don't provide expertise to these subjects. Uh, we thought about the controlled recollection design. We randomly divided the sample in two groups. Uh, half of the officials received an expertise prime. Uh, basically, they read as public official, you have to deal with a variety of issues. In some instances, this involves making decisions on issues you have extensive experience on. Take two minutes to describe an instance where your specific expertise was important to solve an issue or push legislation forward. Then there's a placebo group that spent the same amount of time talking about how they started, uh, be they became interested in politics. Okay, the idea here is to heighten perceptions of expertise on the treatment group on these subjects here to see how that affects um, Self-confidence that we measure with this item here, agreement with the statement, I often have doubts about my own decisions in office, or uh, a measure of um, dogmatism. It's a waste of time to pay attention to certain ideas. Okay? So our prediction in, in line with our proposed mechanism is that <clears throat> uh, expertise, uh, heightened perceptions of expertise would lead to more self-confidence, so more disagreement with this statement and more agreement with this statement here. Uh, we find suggestive evidence in line with the first um, idea that uh, heightened expertise leads to more self-confidence. There's no evidence for the second statement here. Okay, just one final thought. Um, um, <clears throat> we conducted this in a party-centric system. Sweden has uh, um, robust parties and politicians are mainly party representatives, they work for the party. Uh, one concern is about like the relevance of this issue is that this potential bias that we uh, describe here could cancel out when politicians come collectively uh, and make decisions, collectively make decisions, I'm sorry. Since only a small part of them should have engaged in this, should engage in this type of bias. However, at least some survey uh, evidence from Sweden suggests that it's exactly in the areas where politicians have more expertise that they are more likely to influence the position of the party. Okay, this is not specific to, to Sweden, uh, but uh, so what this means is that if politicians in their areas of expertise are more likely to discount opinions that is agree with, this may not cancel out when politicians collect, sorry, parties collectively make decisions. That's the point here. Just to wrap up, um, so what we describe here as the expertise curse is this idea that 
legislators with more policy expertise, maybe systematically less capable of voicing public preferences in exactly those areas where they have more knowledge. We uh, find some suggestive evidence uh, that this may be due to overconfidence. Okay. <clears throat> uh, one important next step, in my view, is improving how we measure policy expertise. Uh, we do it in two different ways here, but we're still clearly conflating policy expertise with both issue salience or even with just confidence in your beliefs in a given area. And uh, we'd like to get closer to the idea of uh, something that is about specialized knowledge and what comes with that. So any suggestion, suggestions on that would be particularly welcome. Uh, uh, but putting that issue aside for now, uh, if we believe this, these arguments, uh, we believe that expertise curves may provide a, a new explanation, a complementary explanation for variations in part, patterns of responsiveness. Um, <clears throat> I think more interestingly, the results suggest that there may be there may be a trade-off between expertise and policy implementation. The idea basically is that we know that expertise is key for policy making and, uh, and we, are, we are not at any point questioning that. However, failing to account for social context, cultural norms, and so public preferences in that way can lower public compliance to, to different policies, right? So uh, I think my main point here is that um, expertise and responsiveness, we don't believe they are incompatible in any way. Uh, I think in the same way that we are describing these results here, we can provide this information to politicians. And I believe that at least from my previous experience interacting with politicians in this way, we can uh, make them overcome biases like this. So that's the main message here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Miguel. Uh, so I'm now going to turn things over to Ali Saron from Cornell. Okay, great. Um, I actually did not make slides and I'll send a copy of these comments to you. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to discuss. This was a really nice, uh, very polished paper um, and a salient topic. And um, I thought the execution uh, was quite cool. Uh, part of an existing survey. Elites are, you know, typically very hard to survey. So this is a nice contribution to the literature. I also really like study too, even though you don't have any effects. Um, I thought that was a, a neat idea. So future, um, future work, I really think should include that. So given that the experiments already run, um, most of my comments will be on framing um, and robustness. Um, and in particular, many of my comments might indicate to you where you should flesh the paper out to get through the review process, right? Because um, I'm a comparativist, but I could equally get uh, this type of paper given the Swedish case. Um, okay, so first of all, some comments on theory and framing. And so uh, I think there is a trade-off between kind of representation and using expertise but it's not necessarily a bad one. And the expertise curse is framed in a negative way in this paper. Um, and you know, I know that kind of like the Dunning-Kruger effect and overconfidence, you know, it's a very popular topic and I do think it exists in the world, uh, but there's a larger literature on this very tension that I think you need to engage with from comparative politics because being responsive is not always being representative, right? And so this is Stokes, Manon, and Shavorsky, their book on democracy, accountability, and representation. Uh, you know, we elect politicians to specialize. Politicians who get elected have specialized information. You know, they, they uh, get elected on a platform to do X. They realize that the state of the world is worse than they thought. And then they execute Y, you know, helping voters understand because voters don't, or the, the majority opinion of voters might not be what is actually needed. You know, this was Stokes' work in Argentina, right? And so I think it's important to engage with this because uh, I think the conclusions of your paper that, you know, you might be overconfident if you have expertise does not necessarily translate into a, a bad outcome, right? So you could be being very representative if you know more than your voters or you take actions that are against kind of um, your voters. And so I encourage you to engage with that literature. It might give you, um, it might give you more uh, oomph kind of in the paper. And also, you know, further, it's important to recognize that you don't have a behavioral measure, right? So a politician could very well think that they are more skilled and the voters are wrong and still represent them, 
right? Especially in close issues and issues where it's not clear what, you know, the right policy is, uh, you know, office seeking politician might actually, you know, realize that they are the lawyer, they know regulation better, but if a majority of their voters are just on the other side, they might still represent them, but respond to your survey that the voters are wrong. Like my voters are wrong, but I want to get reelected. So I'm ready to do this, right? Um, or, you know, being more normative and being more optimistic, you know, maybe uh, politicians realize this and then use this to go kind of convince voters, right? Um, so future uh, surveys, I would ask maybe incorporate a question, you know, what would politicians do? Like, if you disagree with your voters, what do you do? Or if you disagree with your party, what do you do? And I know, you know, you talk about this a bit in the paper that, you know, you don't want to introduce bias, you know, what would they do in hypotheticals? You don't think you'll elicit the truth, but, you know, given your topic, I think it's worth thinking more, um, you know, could you incorporate a measure that asks the politician what they would do in the face of disagreement, because you could equally see behavioral outcomes in the real world not matching your dependent variables. And then John already brought up this comment, but I really think the district matters, right? Because, you know, if we're thinking about representation, it's really district specific. And this comes up kind of in two ways. Uh, one is, you know, whatever the national opinion is, you know, uh, representatives don't have to care about the national opinion. They need to care one, about their district and two about the pivotal voters in their district, right? More so maybe in majoritarian contexts, which Sweden is not, but uh, some of this is a phrasing issue in the survey. So in future rounds, I would say majority of voters in your district, right? Opposed to just the majority of voters because if I'm a politician reading the way that survey question is phrased, I might think of the national uh, currents, uh, right? Um, and then, you know, okay, so on the issues you brought up, I mean, is it possible to geocode the individuals in the survey, try to come up, because you have public opinion data on these issues, try to come up with a localized measure because you might see politicians breaking in different ways if they're from the West. And again, you wouldn't be able to do it at the district level, but maybe, I don't know, West, East, North. You know, the West, everyone is really issued or worried about um, refugees while, you know, the other part of the country is not, do you see differential effects in terms of, you know, how, well, actually it could be a lot of different measures you find different effects. And so that would be one way to do it using the data that you have, try to come up with a more localized measure of the opinions on this issue. Um, because you do lose this finding when you cluster, cluster by issue area, or you lose the majority opinion finding. And I think it has to do with this. Cause I think politicians are picking up that this, you know, it's not really a district level. Um, uh, measure. Um, and also, I would like to hear more about these issues. Um, because, you know, the issue areas you picked, you, you said you piloted, you said you pre-tested, right? Um, but again, you know, if these issues kind of public sufficiently split, some of those issues were less split than others. And thinking kind of to formal theory where uh, most of the formal models when we're talking about information acquisition are there's a true state of the world, there's what voters think, you know, and how do, pol how do they elect politicians to match it? You know, I mean, there is evidence that increasing refugees is not bad, right? And so, you know, how many of these issues is there actually a way, you know, is there actually an accepted truth that then you can compare to what politicians think? Some of them, maybe not charter schools, I don't know, but otherwise, you know, that might be another way to explore the issues. But I would like to hear more case specific information about um, the issues. And then finally, my last um, set of comments before I open it up, and I have other um, other comments because again, it was a really rich paper. Uh, but I would like to see more kind of exploration of heterogeneous treatment effects and subgroups, right? Um, you do some of these, but particularly in your case, there might be kind of theoretical reasons why we would affect why we expect treatment effects to vary by some of these subgroups, right? And at one point you say, you know, you have a diverse group of representatives from all main parties and all levels of government. But we might think that the connection between kind of representation varies, whether you're a local politician in Sweden. Um, I do a lot of work in the Norwegian case. I, I, I think that this is the same, but a lot of times a part-time, right? Politicians are part-time in Sweden versus being full-time at the national level, right? Um, if I know, you know, my constituents more because I'm, am I their mayor? Is it more costly to ignore their opinion versus if I'm at the national level, you know, a random group of voters come and tells me something I already knew. Right, so be interesting to kind of see the multi-level. Um, I mean, except the European, you don't have enough. Uh, I don't think to do the European level, but that's kind of weird, kind of anyway. Right, 
Um, and in particular, what I thought was really interesting is half of your respondents don't have a college degree, which is one of your measures of expertise. And I think that this might vary quite a bit between national, because that's relatively high for a place like Sweden, but it's not if you think of, you know, these local offices that are part time, you know, you can more easily get these by showing other skills opposed to the traditional kind of elite measures, right? You might see interactive effects between college education, local, and then response. And then uh, Dan Butler has a new paper. He showed it at the, the, the NYU, um, the Becky Morton conference about differences in female politicians responsiveness. So expectations from constituents from female politicians are much higher than male politicians. You have it, you know, add a section. That would be great to see. And finally, um, there are a couple of Swedish papers that I think you should add um, that tell you more about your sample population. Cause even, you know, these are anonymized, right? So, you know, your ability, you know, you can learn from the descriptives, but the other work that you should cite um, is the, the Torsten, Persson, uh, Fulke, and Rickney, or Be sorry, Besley paper, Rickney, Besley, all of them, I'll send you the links, um, about gender quotas. So, you know, Sweden adopt gender quotas. Guess what? It improved the average quality of female politicians and the average quality of male politicians once they adopted the quota. So Swedish politicians are on average uh, better. Um, and then also they have the recent APSR that shows that parties are using these open list competitions to select higher candidates, right? So if you get more preference votes on the first round. So this just tells you that you are in a case, that Sweden is a case where politicians are very cognizant of these preference votes. Preference votes help them get elected in the future, you know, uh, which means that in particular, you know, these types of things would, I think, help you frame the paper and help, you know, sell the paper in terms of external ability. Um, so I'm going to stop there uh, so we can open it up, but I'll send you these comments. Um, and again, you know, really, pop, prop, really polished paper, a lot of good stuff here. Um, I look forward to seeing it land somewhere. Very good. Any response, Miguel? Did you want to respond to anything Ellie brought up? Just, just very briefly, Ali. Thank you so much. This, this is great. There's a lot, a lot to think here, and a lot of good suggestions and practical suggestions, which I love. Uh, on the first point, uh, toning down the kind of negative tone of the paper, or kind of, the, I completely agree with that, and, and I'm currently in the process of revising this. And I, yeah, yeah, I, that's exactly what the direction this should move. And so I, I yeah, I agree. Um, District matters. I, I completely agree. <laughs> well, I agree for the last 30 minutes because I did I had not uh, had thought about this before. So I think um, basically I, I, I was thinking from the beginning that this was a sample of national politicians and I knew it was not, but I yeah, it is what it is. Um, there's still a case to be made that the effects so so having variation in public pref in public opinion at in different levels of government no local le level regional level across the country uh, that should generate a measurement error uh, why why it should bias the results in, in a way that we see the results here uh, i don't have an obvious story but this is obviously no no explanation for not doing more to deal with that a challenge obviously is subnational measures of public opinion are hard everywhere um, in the Swedish case, probably a little less impossible than in other places because there are two main public opinion surveys that have been asking the same questions uh, to voters. So I can try to merge them and try to get uh, some leverage there to, to have more refined measures of constituency preference. So that's, that's great. Um, <clears throat> some of the other points I, I, I completely agree too about the importance of looking carefully at the different issues. I think I'll add some more information about this in the paper. The, the study obviously is not designed or powered to look at the issues separately, but, but this, is a, yeah, this is something that definitely could give some more nuance to the paper. One last point, uh, it's true that only 50% uh, of uh, the politicians having a college degree is a relatively low bar compared to most countries. It's also true that Sweden is a bit of an outlier in this regard. Sweden has many, much more working class politicians and politicians with a, without college degrees than most European countries or Western countries. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. And I'm 
Okay. I have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Uh, John, is there anything you want to ask right now? I, I, let's do the q and I, I do have some okay. stuff. Uh, so one question from Penelope Ferguson um, uh, asks, um, how can the expertise curse be brought into open awareness? So it's sort of policy, it's sort of a consequences, a policy consequences. So putting aside uh, Ali's concern that this may not be a curse after all, let's assume it is a curse. How can we, how can we do anything about it more publicly? Uh, and so some of my early work has done similar things. And so I'm glad you asked. Um, in, in a previous study, I, uh, it was a survey of politicians in Switzerland, and I had some arguments about why politicians have biased um, beliefs about public preferences. And so, and I had arguments for why that was happening. And what I did in that survey, the survey was conducted 10 days before a referendum. And I was asking them to anticipate the results of that referendum, but randomly assigned them to different cues, really just informational cues. For instance, in this case would be, you know that we often, well, we just tell them what, what this story is about. Uh, so th that there's a chance that they may underestimate uh, or they, dis they may discount opinions that disagree in their areas of expertise. Uh, I could then ask them to anticipate the results of this referendum and then compare whether this corrective, basically this, this nudge, can, would lead to more accurate beliefs about voter preferences or more accurate predictions of these referendums that are about to happen. So that's what I did in some previous work, testing different questions, but that's one way I, I've dealt with it in the past. Um, I think one thing that is important about that is that if that something like that works, it suggests that this is less strategic than at least it seems to be, it, it may be, right? So if, if politicians are willing to respond to these types of simple nudges, probably it's really an issue of, uh, um, uh, of, of not having the exact uh, set of information to make the, the best decisions, but not the best, the, the decisions they are interested in, in making. So that's how I would think about it. Okay, uh, George Krauss asked a couple questions here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go ahead and read, read them. Uh, picking up on John's point regarding uh, rational politicians, is it possible that what appears as expert politicians discounting voters is driven by quote, policy coverage? That is what appears as voter discount, discounting or lack of responsiveness is conflating expertise with particularism and clientele audiences since politicians' expertise is often driven by concentrated policy investments, which may naturally be at odds with generalist policy preferences of voters. Yeah, that Jeff did a better job than I could of reading it. So yeah, so yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. I'm coming from John's perspective, like are there rational explanations that account for what you're claiming is behavioral biases? Okay, uh, one question, one answer, I think there are multiple possible answers. One that I could think is one of the things politicians do is, is persuading voters. Is they 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 push uh, uh, well they, they they try to convince voters to support ideas that they think are the, the best ideas, right? So if you, it's possible that in their areas of expertise they are more likely to do this. So they would be more likely to just kind of strategically uh, discount these ideas because now that really doesn't matter. I'm going to tell them what what they really. Should should know, so that's could could that be an answer to this? I'm sure there are other answers. That doesn't necessarily rule out the possibility that you have concentrated versus diffuse preferences. The more expert a legislator is, the more constant more they've invested in a policy area, the more they're going to be concerned with a subset of the electorate relating to those policy investments. So what I'm wondering is, if I'm really focused on ag, right? If I'm Pat Roberts from Kansas you know, spent decades in the House and Senate with, on the Ag Committee. I really care about that. I care less, I have a lot of expertise in ag policy. I care less about what other people think who may not be in that milieu, that, that policy, uh, about their views on ag policy. And they will be the ones who will get upset and respond if you, if you change course, right? This, this, 
this subset of the constituency that really cares about an issue. Is it, I think that's how I'm interpreting that. Yeah. I, I think it's just so, yeah, it's just something that I think you want to be careful of because what you could be claiming is a policy expertise discounting effect could be just different interests, right? Particularistic versus more general interests. You know, so you just, you know, that's just an mm -hmm. alternative explanation you may want to just think about or engage. Maybe I'm wrong about it, but I'm just trying to come at it from angles to be helpful where people can come at behavioral biases. And that's what my second comment that Jeff has is about, we, about the nature of, the, how do we know these are behavioral type biases? Um, and I'll let Jeff read the question. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna make me work here, George. Um, Perhaps an experimental design that can involve decisions made by voters and politicians in which a quote baseline is observed to assess both the accuracy versus bias considerations when making policy decisions slash forming opinions. Not only is this critical to have confidence in making claims about overconfidence and other behavioral biases, but also to effectively discriminate the extent that expert politicians may value minimizing decision errors and are willing to incur greater bias and responsiveness. Uh, this is something clearly beyond the scope of this particular yeah. study's design but I deem necessary to engage the issues of overconfidence and closed-minded cognition in a manner that can distinguish policy bias based on objective information or conditions, as opposed to merely reflecting disagreement discordance between expert politicians and voters, which this study claims is the basis for such lower policy responsiveness. It's a very, it's a very good point. Um, one thing that I would say about this, and so in this other work that I've done in Sweden, in Switzerland that I mentioned, my argument there was that politicians overestimate, or, or basically they, they, when they think about public preferences, they disproportionately think about the preferences of more affluent voters, okay? So that's potential explanation for uh, inequalities and responsiveness. Uh, in that particular case, I also received a similar question that politicians would be, could be simply uh, being strategic about this and could not be an issue of information because they know that uh, affluent voters are the ones that are more likely to turn out, are the ones that fi finance their campaigns, all those, kind of, those kinds of things. Uh, I think the, res the best response I found for that is that in this particular study where, that, where I randomly assigned them two informational cues, telling them about these types of biases, they responded to that and became more accurate in their beliefs. And if it was purely strategic, in my interpretation, they, they would have no incentives to respond to that information. So I think in that particular case, I, the evidence suggests that information, information deficiencies uh, play some role at least. Ellie, did you have like a two finger on this? Yeah, I did. So on the expertise kind of issue, right? So I kind of two, I have a comment and like a question. Um, so what's interesting is that the paper is framed very abstract, right? So it is expertise and then how do, you know, the politicians respond, right? Uh, and so the reader, without seeing your experimental, the experimental part, the reader is most likely thinking when it comes to expertise in politicians, either politician specific capital, which is committee service, right? Or potentially prior occupation, right? So think about like a lawyer, an ex-lawyer passing regulation, right? I have a JD, I would be much better on the judiciary committee than, you know, like Joe Schmo, who's not, right? Um, and then when you come to your empirical, so you're measuring self-reported expertise, which could be ego, right? Could be total fluff. College education, which also, uh, uh, oh, and then seniority. And then on the seniority, you actually call this passive expertise. I would rename this because of all the things like, you know, what, what you chose to invest in, in when you were 18 in college is much more passive than you know, I have been around for 10 years, I have hustled, I've gotten expertise, right? So I, I would maybe rename this, but so, okay, when you think about all these different expertise, I would be a little bit more upfront about this in the paper and then going forward for future work, it would be great if you could get more information or maybe it's in the survey. I mean, it's kind of tough, right? Because the more detailed information you can, the more you can back out the politicians, so they might prevent you from doing this. But if you can get I have expertise, I've served on these types of committees, like put a question, you know, what is your expertise? Have, and then, you know, have you served on a 
like a political committee related to this? Do you have neighborhood local civil service experience on this? You know, if you could put in those two questions, because then it'd be great to see, I answer that I have expertise, but you know, I don't have an occupational question that verifies this and I did not answer yes, I have served on a relevant committee. Then you could isolate the pure, you know, these are the, the Dunning effect people that are like, oh yeah, I know this. I, I do home, you know, like my, my wife's a nurse. I know more about health, you know, which is not, so it'd be great kind of in future, if you could tease that out, this paper would have a lot of punch because you'd really be isolating the blowhards from the folks. And then you might be able to better engage with uh, politician specific capital, which would be have I served on a committee assignment versus occupational markers, which could be equally valued as a politician, right? But you might have a different, you know, you might have a different, you might have different effects depending on, on those three things. So I would, that would be great to see in future, in future work. Over to John. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I just want to echo Ali's discussion comments, which I think I, I, I just to give you more feedback, I, I think I, to me, those all, those all resonated with me. Um, this discussion has, has brought up, it's helped me think a little bit about kind of what you're doing in the paper and what you're not doing as well. And I think it's very interesting. Obviously you're embedded in this bigger discussion about representation and, and a, a, a variety of evidence of which I've done some, so I'm, perhaps I'm biased here about showing that, it, you know, there's not great, great representation, it seems. Um, but it's, it seems to me at some level, you don't really have the goods in this paper to really talk much about representation because you don't really look at, you don't really have any evidence on policy outcomes. You don't know if they're actually acting on, on, their, on their, their information here or anything. So it almost seems to me that what, what you're really doing, which is, and, and that's, this, isn't to, this isn't to diminish what you're doing. I think it's, it's very good. What, in some sense, what you're really doing, I think is, is telling us about how sort of expert, le expert, le expert representatives think. Uh, and how do they process information? And this is kind of a subset of the literature, which I think is 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 hugely important. Um, and I, I think it gets to a bunch of issues. There's a normative issue of, of how should they think. Uh, uh, clearly, we're using this benchmark in the literature that if the majority wants it, you know, you probably ought to do it. But of course, we know that that's that's not exactly right. There's there's situations where you put representatives in there and you don't want them to do what the majority uh, wants as well, but the question is: Are they are they overriding the majority opinion in the correct times or 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 the incorrect times? So, I wonder. In hearing you know some of George's comments and, and just thinking about this, I wonder if a better way to position your paper is to say you're studying how how experts respond to information that's coming in from from the outside, and there's 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 good ways to do that and there's bad ways to do it. And one way is was what you know is your sort of expertise curse way. Uh, the other way is kind of a rational way. And I wonder if it might make more sense for this paper for you to frame it exactly like that. And there's two competing views of how they're behaving. Uh, there's a rational way to respond to information and there's sort of a, 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 a uh, I guess you, a biased one. Cause that's what's lurking around in the margins here. A lot of these comments are, well, wouldn't a, re wouldn't a reasonable expert actually think their opinion matters more than outsiders and so forth and so on. But I wonder if you could do that because I think the way it's, the way it's being framed in your talk is you, you've you sort of fleshed out a little bit this behavioral story, but you haven't really fleshed out and done justice to the rational story. You haven't said, what would a rational expert do uh, in, in, in a democratic system? And so you're not really running a very good horse race. And I think part of the comments that are coming up are that some of the evidence you're putting up there could be consistent with either story. So I think it might be nice if you had some implications which would cut different ways. A rational person would behave, you know, a rational inf uh, user of information would behave in a different way than, some, than one of these biased people. Um, and this may go beyond, beyond your current study, but as I, as I was thinking about what the differences would be in my mind, a couple of dimensions uh, pop up right away. Um, one way would be a, kind of an issue specific distinction. We would expect experts to reasonably and rationally override outside information on, ex on issues having to do with expertise that, that really are technical in nature. Um, if, if I say I'm an expert on you know, abortion policy, um, well, that's not really an expertise issue. So me overriding my constituents is, is probably not likely that I have some deep scientific knowledge that makes me superior to them. It, it's probably just that I have a preference. But if it's something about you know, the mechanics of, of how we, we regulate you know, um, discharges of, of chemicals into water, well, then, well maybe that's a more, a more technical issue. So it seems like one dimension that experts might reasonably override depends on what, what the issue is. So it seems to me that might be one, one way to go. And the other way you might go is to look a little bit about how informed um, ordinary people are. Because, because one thing uh, uh, 
there's some issues where, where people have actually strong opinions about things and they feel they actually are well informed. Others, they're very ignorant and they say, well, I want you to make the decision for me. That's why, that's why you're in there. I don't, I don't really know. You can ask me to poll, I'll give you an answer, but those are the things where you should override. And so again, if you could sort of distinguish some way between the information level in the voters, uh, that might give you a way to, to distinguish it. Again, because kind of a rational, a rational expert should override voters in cases when voters are not actually uh, informed, but not in cases when they are informed. So I, I'm just throwing some ideas out there. I know it might be a little bit beyond beyond what, what you're doing, but but I think if you framed it in terms of these two competing views, I think you might be able to get more purchase on on some of these questions. Fantastic comments. Thank you to the both the both both last set of comments are, are really great. And I, I would just say one thing. I, I, in the last month, I've been trying to find time to tone down the language of the paper, and I just didn't have time to do this. And this has to do with toning down the negative uh, kind of uh, vibe of the, of the text, but also uh, really just focusing on what actually I'm, uh, like the outcome here is, which is not, as you say, responsiveness, the big picture that motivates it. It is about responsiveness, but, but not uh, what the specific study is doing. And, and I think that is playing against the, the, the study. So I, I really thank you for, for these suggestions. Yeah. Let me go ahead and read a, a comment that Adam Zelazar wrote in, um, and Adam can chime in after I read if he, if he likes. Uh, studying the intersection of expertise and representation is fantastic. Much of the experimental work on policymaking focuses on one side. Miguel and I more on the former, Dan Butler and David Brockman more on the latter. Uh, Christian has worked on both sides. I think bridging the gap is really a clever idea. Let me add another way to think about framing in theory, that of pandering. Standard, standard pandering models of voters with a belief about what the better policy option is. Politicians may receive a private signal about the better policy, depending on their quality. And then the politician decides what policy to support to convince the voters that they're a high quality politician. The mechanism is different in a potentially interesting way. Politicians incentives to appear competent cause trade-offs in being responsive versus incorporating expertise. Different politicians will adopt different strategies, et cetera. So this, I mean, this, you know, I think of the pandering literature, I think of, you know, Kane's Roan and, and Schatz and some of that work here. Uh, Adam, did you want to say anything more? No, I think that's right. That was the model I had in mind. Um, I think it's just another mechanism to add to the ones that others have identified as well. And I'm not aware of any experimental work with real policymakers on pandering. So that could be another interesting way to, maybe there are, but none come to my mind. Okay. Thank you, Adam. This is great. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I always start thinking in terms of behavioral arguments, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it's probably like a, a reaction to a one year training. Uh, but uh, th this is a great point, and I, I, yeah, I have to think more about how to design something to capture this idea. But I love it. Thank you, Adam. Any other questions from the panelists? I have one uh, thought from uh, Jeff Godbout who said, you could potentially use the 2003 Swedish Euro referendum results at the county municipal levels to estimate a more precise measure of constituency opinion, at least on that issue. I, I didn't follow who made this question. I'm this sorry. is uh, Jeff Godbout, who's at the University of Montreal. Oh, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yes. I saw Christian Rose was raising his hand. Yeah, I had one thought. I mean, I'm, I think I'm just going to belabor some of the same stuff, but why can you just make a case for why this is a behavioral? Like instead of instead of saying, oh, well, maybe it is the pandering, maybe it's something else. You have some evidence that people who think they're experts or have some measurement of expertise, like I think college degrees was one, are impervious to updating the constituency opinion, like, is this a behavioral thing? And can you give like a strong, make, can you make a strong argument for that? Uh, not, not right now, no, but uh... <laughs> no, I, All right, I, it's just a thought, like maybe you want to just lean into that, right? Because the... at the job talk, I would give a different answer, but, uh, okay. but I think <laughs> that's I, fine. A definitive answer I don't have right now. And I think that's what you are pushing me to. And I, I appreciate that. And, and I think that's something to think about. So Christian, when you, when you ask whether, and people have talked about behavioral models here, 
Are you speaking about them being psychological models or is this truly a more behavioral model in the sense that, you know, it deals with things like updating? I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I didn't write it, so I don't, I haven't thought okay. about it very much, but just listening to the discussion, like I think a lot of times, at least in, in my own work, a lot of stuff that, a, a lot of elected officials act like regular people sometimes and stuff we take for granted with regular people behaviorally come out in some of these experiments. I mean, it doesn't mean like an equilibrium that there's not a rational um, explanation, but I do think on some of these um, experiments with elites, they end up looking a lot like regular people in terms of cognitive biases and so on. And so maybe you want to just make lean into that a little bit, but I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it well. Um, in, in his case, would, would the fact that he's looking, you know, he has local elites and national elites would you assume the local elites are more like real people in that sense, or regular people is the term used now? No, I mean, they have different incentives than regular people, right, to get reelected. So they're still different in that way. But I mean, in terms of when you give people surveys, no matter who they are, they may respond similarly. I think there's a little bit more of that, that to think about. Um, the like, are, how different are they really if you just did this with regular people and asked them to imagine they're in the same situation and they might be pretty similar. Um, just, like just it's kind of in contrast to what everyone is saying. Uh, yeah, just, just, just following up on that because I think it's a really good point, but th this is where the, the link to representation is a big step because we, we kind of understand that uh, politicians are people. So they're gonna have, they're gonna have all the stuff that they do. That's why we build political systems to actually make them not not do that, right? That's that's why we subject them to elect electoral pressures and so forth. This paper isn't really looking at any of those stuff. It's just saying just at, at the level of their own reactions, how are, how are they doing? So that's why I, I agree with you, Kristen. It's it's let's do, let's double down here and really go into how are they thinking. Uh, I, there's a big gap that still has to be crossed whether whether we whether our electoral mechanisms are are are, are correcting that problem at all. This has nothing at all about that. So, I, and I think that probably needs to be carefully de delineated. So this is probably a, a simple question for you because people have probably had to answer it before, but just on, on a basic, on basic compliance, how do you know the politicians themselves are actually answering these surveys? If you hand it off to a junior staff member, uh, is, that a, is that an issue? Uh, usually, uh, so in this particular case, uh, we, uh, from what I know about the, 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 the panel and how it works, it, they are the, the actual politicians answering the emails, they kind of uh, have their, the, there's a formal, a formal communication going on between the research team and the politicians and they kind of promise to do it. There's still a chance that staffers answer some questions. Um, I would say this, uh, so two things. First, um, for local level politicians, staffers are actually often non-existent. So, so in, in that context, I believe this is less of an issue, but the way I've seen this addressed in literature, and I think it's a proper way of thinking about it, is that we think of politicians as an enterprise, There's the individual politicians and the staffers that work for him and that work in their name. So if it happens that it's a politician, uh, a staffer answering an email, by a constituent in an audit experiment, for instance, or if they are the ones answering the survey, um, <clears throat> they are also the ones influencing the politician to, to vote on an issue A or B. So uh, that's how usually um, this idea is, is addressed in the literature. But it is, if we believe that staffers may be fundamentally different from politicians on a given issue, um, on a given way of processing information, that, that could be a problem. Okay. I mean, I was just thinking of the, go ahead, go ahead. So, I mean, there's, I haven't published this, but when I've done work where I've actually surveyed legislators or public officials and staff, the staff tend to, to be, the staff tend to be more rational and thoughtful in their responses than the actual elected officials and the elites, especially at the local and lower levels. And even just some of the stuff, the actual, one, I'm not that concerned that the in this case, because of the high propensity of these folks to answer surveys, right? In this, they're they're used to and it's probably mostly politicians in your paper. But even in some of the other papers, the 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 it's not just staff. And then when it's not staff is when you're more likely to, I think, get these behavioral and cognitive biases 
coming out at least in survey responses. Hmm. Okay. Ellie, did you, you have your hand raised there? You're muted. Yeah, virtual hand, yeah. Um, so, so, because, you know, I was encouraging you to kind of add a hypothetical behavioral measure, which is, you know, would you vote against this and stuff? But if, if you will, if you do reframe the paper or future projects in terms of just trying to figure out what politicians are thinking, then it would also be worth trying to capture data or distinguishing between what a politician's preference is. This is something in kind of my other comments where, you know, we talk about what is a politician's preference, right? You say that and you, I assume that I am an individual. If you elect me, I have a particular preference. It might be normative or, you know, it might be like social liberal, like abortion, or it might be, I have done empirical work on fracking and I know that this is kind of a bad idea, right? But when you ask a politician what their preference is, what do you get in a survey, right? Do you get the party line? Do you get what they think voters want? Do you get their actual preference as an informed individual that they volunteer with the hopes of teaching voters something, in which case you, you know, you would maybe see that more in like expertise. And so, you know, it might be given, given your current setup, if you could elicit a politician's preference on that issue and try and figure out like, is this your personal preference? Is this your party's preference? Plus then voters majority opinion on it, plus the disagreement measure, you know, that would be kind of another interesting dynamic that's much more in the individual survey, individual beliefs framing versus again on the representation, right? So, cause you know, you might have cool, you know, think about like the two by two, you might, you might have cool cells in your cross tab where a politician has a distinctly different preference from a majority of voters, you know, are they more likely to follow their own preference if they're an expert, assuming they have one. Now it's tricky to elicit any of this on these types of surveys. And so I will leave that to people better than I <laughs> who do survey data. All of my individual respondents are always dead. So, you know, survey things are not necessarily my, my thing, but this would be a cool dimension within the, how do politicians think if I'm an expert, I might be more likely to have an informed opinion that would then clash where if I'm not, my personal opinion as a person doesn't matter as much. That might be a, that might be a cool thing to add in the future. Just a suggestion again, bring yeah. salt with all of these. In, in, the, in the American case, I know people have tried to put all of these different parts into a common space, right? I think people started with the Project Vote Smart data uh, in terms of congressional choice. And I think Jesse Richmond kind of dabbled in this a little bit with, with regard to public opinion surveys, essentially trying to, to get everything on the same scale and to try to begin to parse all of these different things out. I, I haven't followed where this literature really is in the last half dozen years though. Uh, Miguel, is this, is this part of a larger project? You, you mentioned that there are, you're now in the waves, the teen waves, right, of this, this survey. Are you gonna go back to the well and try to do some more? Um, I think I, one thing, well, before our conversation today, one thing that I wanted to, to go back to uh, was trying to, something very similar to what Ally suggested, which is, trying to get some more precise uh, measures of expertise, either uh, as measure, measuring their uh, professional academic background or actually ask, asking them factual questions about these different policy areas to see if they actually uh, uh, deliver on, the, on that uh, purported expertise. So that's one of the ideas that we thought, um, yeah. But now I have like the whole list. Of <laughs> yeah. Now you have a bunch of bunch of different papers to write, right? Yeah. Okay. Any final thoughts? We have a couple minutes. All right. Well, if not, uh, thanks very much to Ali Saron for providing a, an excellent discussant uh, role today. Uh, John Matsusaka and Christian Gross from USC. Uh, George Krause from I was going to say Pitt, but uh, University of Georgia, Adam Zelizer from Chicago, uh, and the rest of the attendees. Uh, my old student, JF, was a good question or a good point that he wrote in. Uh, so uh, I think we're about at time then. Uh, thanks again. And this, this, was a, this was a great workshop, a lot of great comments and questions.